Welcome to the On-Premise IT Roundtable, the only podcast that dares to be both on topic and in every location. My name is Tom Hollingsworth and I am a part of the Gestalt IT Network. I specialize in things like networking and security. And each episode, we bring you the perspectives of a group of very important luminaries in the IT industry. And we give them a premise, a topic, if you will, to debate and discuss, but we're always on premise. I'd like to take a moment for our guests to introduce themselves before we introduce the premise for this episode today, starting with Taryn. Hey, Tom. Yeah, my name is Taryn Bryson. My Twitter handle is at some clown. Uh, I basically am a network engineer doing a lot of stuff with a lot of things and other stuff. <laughs> All right, Rita. My name's Rita Younger. Um, I'm SDN underscore girl on Twitter and also co-founder co of TotalPackets.com. Um, what I do for a living, though, what pays the bills is I run a data center practice. All right. And Ben. Hi, Tom. My name is Ben Story. I'm a network security engineer, and you can find me on Twitter at NTWRK80. All right. Thank you all for joining us today. Let's jump into the premise for today's episode. I mentioned security in the opening. It's something that we have to deal with on a daily basis because, well, we, we need to stay safe. And one of the things that we've seen that happens quite frequently in the industry is that a piece of software that we use gets hacked. Uh, maybe someone guesses a password, or in the event of something even larger, like we've seen with the uh, solar winds breach from late 2020, uh, there's more going on than meets the eye. But what happens after we've detected the breach? What happens when we figure out that something is amiss and we need to solve the problem? Do we shut everything down and take stock of what's going on? Or do we rip everything out and throw it all away and start over from scratch? Uh, I've seen both solutions, and I don't necessarily know that one is better than the other. So the premise for today's episode is, when we get hacked, do we have to rip it all out and throw it away? Um, I'd like to actually start with Mr. Ben's story, because he's the one who brought this idea to us a little bit, and it's kind of related to the solar winds issues that we're starting to see. They're actually ongoing. Uh, each week brings us a new uh, twist in the tale. Uh, ben, have you ever been in a situation where you've had a piece of software or one of your tools that's been uh, compromised and uh, management told you you got to toss it out with the bathwater? Uh, actually, uh, we, we definitely have. I mean, as a uh, VAR, we are often asked by our customers, you know, what do we do? What do we do? And we get different responses depending on their security postures. And it's been interesting because internally we debate between ourselves on okay, do we tell them just to rip it out and replace it? Or do we tell them to shut it down? Let's figure out what's going on or, you know, what, what take do we go on? And with, with solar winds in particular, it's been quite contentious within our practice. Um, we have like two or three of us that say, no, we, we can make this work. Um, and there's another guy that it's, it's time to rip it out. Solar winds is dead to us. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely not an easy sell either direction. I believe, um, I believe this really points out the lack of vis visibility in general that we have to what's actually taking place on the network. So sure, it's a very hard lesson, right? Um, but it gives us an opportunity to shore things up because security at the edge was never the solution. And if these 33,000 customers, if they actually had visibility, they may have noticed something going on. That's a very good point. I, I definitely want to bring up that, you know, yes, solar winds was the root cause in a lot of these uh, hacks, but why are we allowing our network monitoring tools to talk directly to the internet without any sort of question as to what they're doing? Um, zero trust means zero trust, even to the network monitoring tool. Well, and I think, you know, one of the things that we see a lot is that network monitoring tools themselves don't get monitored. Right. We, we, you know, we have tools to monitor all of our network, you know, different things. We have, we have security tools. We have, you know, we're looking at this, we're looking at that. But when we look at a big package from SolarWinds or, you know, BMC or PRTG or whoever it might be that we're using for an NMS, it's, it's, you know, sort of left on its own, whether it talks to the internet or not. And I think that's, uh, that's an issue. Well, and it also created a back door where they could get in with more threats. So, um, 
I think that visibility is really important, but you know, just like any type of virus protection, you need to know what is the good traffic on your network versus the bad traffic. So you really have to be, you know, like you said, people don't necessarily use their network monitoring tools. Um, but you need to have a full understanding. You need to know the application dependency mappings. You need to uh, really understand those traffic patterns and you need to fine tune it. So you're really qualifying what is good traffic, what is bad traffic, because if it's crying wolf, you know, we're just going to ignore it. Yeah. And I will, I will just toss out a quick defense of, of solar winds in, in, you know, this is uh, coming from, I, I had the opportunity a few years ago to listen to uh, general Keith Alexander speak live. And uh, he of course was head of the NSA for some time, as well as having a, you know, past career in, in, you know, the military, obviously. And he made this point that uh, when he was head of the NSA, if there was a target that the NSA wanted to get into, he said, they got into it. No questions asked, 100% success rate. If they determined that they needed to get something, they got it. And they never had, you know, they they never had a failure of, of getting into, uh, you know, penetrating a target. He said, however, defense, is extremely difficult, extremely difficult. He said, even for an organization like the NSA or the US DOD or whatever in general, he said, it's extremely difficult to, to block all threats. And I think, so, you know, the solar winds thing, it's like, sure, they, they're in the news, they got hacked. It's a big problem for a lot of people. Uh, but I think it's, it's also, it, it could just as easily have been, you know, any one of the other large software products that get used on our networks, you know, day in, day out. I don't think it's a failure of SolarWinds, uh, strictly speaking. I think they did some things that they shouldn't have uh, and, and probably were lax, uh, lax in, in certain areas. But I think, uh, you know, I think it points to the bigger issue of, of, you know, we're just not doing due diligence on our side, um, you know, monitoring these tools. And I think that that brings up an important point here because, when you think about it, we, we obviously are hyper-focused on the SolarWinds hack because it is fresh in our minds. You know, it's only a few months old as of this recording, but this is not the first time that software programs have been hacked or that database information has been leaked or really that anything has been compromised. And we're talking about the things that people know about. Uh, if you want to rewind the clock all the way back to 2013, when Edward Snowden you know, released a lot of information about things that the NSA and other organizations were doing to backdoor products to create weak elliptical curve technology for encryption that can be easily reversed. It's not just a question of, can we get in? It's a question of, we're going to get in to anything we want to get into. And if you're focused on one part of the equation, you're going to miss everything else. It's just like any magician. Don't look at what my left hand is doing. My right hand's doing all the work. It's misdirection. So by focus, hyper-focusing on certain tools and taking that stance of if it gets hacked, we're going to rip it out, are we really just getting into a situation where not only are we not doing any more good than we did in the original harm, but worse yet, what if it's a situation where we specifically want you to install a tool that we know is easier to get into by breaking the harder tool in the first place? Yeah, that's a good point, Tom. And I think, uh, you know, what my, my personal stance on the SolarWinds hack, by the way, is that I don't think you need to rip out SolarWinds at this point. I think that, uh, you know, look at the look at the Boeing 787 MAX as an example. It's kind of a parallel, right? By the time that plane is back in the air, it's already back in the air now as of, as of uh, you know, when we're recording this. But by the time it's actually sort of pervasive and it's flying everywhere, that is going to arguably be the most safe and scrutinized airplane ever built. Uh, I think SolarWinds is is doing some serious soul searching. And I think with all of the focus in the industry on this hack, you know, I think they're going to emerge as a much stronger, much more secure solution than they were before, number one. And number two, potentially more secure than a lot of the other tools that are out there that are sitting back looking at SolarWinds going, ha ha, they got hacked. Yeah, you've got a good point there, because sometimes it's not what went wrong but how did you fix it? How did you overcome? And yes, their software will be better. I think we have a real problem right now in the industry with all this agile methodology. You know, everyone wants to get their product to market so quickly. Um, and then you've got all kinds of developers who have entered into the field. Um, I think, you know, it's inevitable that it's gonna happen. 
you know, whether it's just bad software or um, it's embedded with some sort of threat. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that the scrutiny that SolarWinds is getting from the industry is going to force them to, to put out a better product. I think we need to take that viewpoint from the from the very beginning of development, security first. And that's not always been the case. And, and you know, SolarWinds is just as bad as any other company in taking a bunch of products that were developed independently and trying to jam them together. And you know, the Frankensteins of the world that are running around in, in our software circles, that's where the problems are going to be. It's those interfaces, you know, um, things that people don't think about anymore. Well, we haven't updated that for 20 years, but it's still there. You just know somebody is going to uh, try it with another software, you know, now it's a challenge. Well, and you've got a couple, you've got a couple different uh, threat vectors, right? If you look at, if you look at who's hacking who, and, you know, the solar winds hack, as far as we know, was, you know, a nation state, right? And, and the big three or four arguably nation states, right, from Russia, China, uh, you know, North Korea and Iran, uh, you know, arguably, uh, they're going to get in just like our NSA is going to get in, you know, they're going to get into certain products there. They have the power to do it. Uh, you know, the, the individual hackers, the sort of uh, folks that are going out there and trying to do ransomware and, and, and this, that, and the other, you know, aren't as well-funded. They get into things, but they're not as well-funded. To hack something like a solar winds takes a very concerted, targeted effort, and this that's what this was, right? So when you look at that, they, this one got discovered. Go look at every other NMS out there that hasn't had scrutiny, that hasn't faced this, how do we know they haven't been hacked already and it's just not been discovered, right? So I don't, I, I think, I think this knee jerk rip out and replace with something else to Tom's kind of original point of like, Hey, maybe they're trying to force us to install something, you know, that's easier to, to deal with. I mean, who knows? I think that's, that's kind of a thing. Well, not only that, but here's something that you need to consider. If I am a, a part-time criminal and I'm looking to get some quick cash from using a WannaCry variant to encrypt, uh, I don't know, let's just say Garmin's network. Um, I'm, I'm just going to spray it everywhere and hope that I get some money back. But if I'm doing this as a long-term goal, which is historically something that nation state backed actors want, they want to penetrate and persist for a significant amount of time to collect information, whether it's for intelligence services or for bl uh, blackmail or resell later, they're not going to pick targets that are easily discoverable or removable. Um, you know, you think back to uh, movie fans, you think back to the Avengers. Yeah, the Mind Stone is what Thanos wanted, but you couldn't just rip it out of the Vision's forehead. It was integrated into who he was. That makes it difficult. So yeah, I would absolutely target your NMS. I would target your Active Directory installation. I would target anything that is maybe a little more compromisable than just the average tool on a laptop. But it's going to be really difficult for you to disengage that because so many of your processes are built around these invisible things. And I mean, when you think all the way back to uh, the, the Latin phrase, who watches the watchers? Well, nobody does. And I like it that way, because even if you do detect this, which it took over almost a year for people to detect that the solar winds uh, hack had happened in some of these, have it gone even longer? I want you to take as long as you can because you still can't get rid of it even when you know what's going on. Yeah, and you know, so many of the advanced persistent threats, um, they go on for years and years. I'm thinking in terms of uh, the Marriott uh, uh, hotels one. Um, they go on for years and they are very difficult to detect because they're exfiltrating information bit by bit by bit. So it's not a big, you know, it's not like they, come in brute force and take everything, you know? It, it's sort of like the old um, uh, song from the 40s or 50s where, where the guy steals a car from the uh, factory one part at a time and, uh, you know, it ends up being a 55, 56, 57, well, you know, it, it's, that's what, that's the hacker mindset now. They, they know they're going to make their payday and they the bit the longer they stay in the bigger that payday is going to be so it's worth the persistence it's worth you know they're not looking for that big splash they don't want to be on the news anymore 
Well, and here, here's a question, I guess, more than a comment. I mean, and, and that is, you know, the old argument of open source, you know, fully scrutinized versus closed source, only the company can get access to the, you know, keys to the kingdom. I mean, is it, would the SolarWinds hack, and I hate to keep going back to it, but would the SolarWinds hack have happened if the software base was open source, you know, because there's so much scrutiny. I mean, the first thing that happens with an open source product besides it gets forked five times is uh you know people start scrutinizing the code base they look for weaknesses they look for every possible buffer overflow and every possible you know exploitable you know avenue into that software and then it gets fixed uh, i don't know how much the big you know nms packages are or or anything really i mean look at the exchange hack too i mean i don't know how many of the closed source software products have that level of scrutiny internally. In other words, does Microsoft have a red team that's actually actively hacking their code base? I don't know. So I have a question. Who is the victim here? Is it SolarWinds or is it the 33,000 customers? Why not both? Yeah, I would argue both. Reputationally, it's SolarWinds, you know, uh, actual damage, you know, potentially uh, from an intelligence gathering point of view and whatever, it's the companies, it's the pass through. But who mm -hmm. assumes the liability at that point? Is it SolarWinds for producing what they at the time thought was a valid product and turned out not to be? Or is it the companies who you know can maybe now say that their security procedures were not as buttoned up as they thought? I mean, that's one of the things that we're actually starting to see is that Microsoft's vulnerability to this kind of intrusion is going to end up being a bigger story because of things like the new exchange hack and a lot of other things going on. SolarWinds may have been the vector, but just like say breaking into a military base, do you fire the guards at the gate for letting me in? Or do you get the entire security detail of the base on report because I was able to go pretty much wherever I wanted without being stopped? It's a hard question to answer. And we've already seen in the Senate hearings that the companies that were directly involved with it, their initial reaction to it was, well, a nation state hack is what we were supposed to do, which I kind of feel is a little bit of a cop out. But, you know, kind of getting back to the original premise of the episode, does that mean that if a company that immediately knew that they'd been hacked by SolarWinds ripped it out right away, that they can then disclaim liability for getting hacked, even though if you've been using SolarWinds or whatever the hack program happens to be, for the five or six months that we knew it was infected, you know, ripping it out now isn't isn't going to do any good. It's like letting closing the barn door after the horses have gotten out. So does does this attempt to shut everything down and rip it all out? Is it really more of an exercise in I'm going to save my job because I didn't do my due diligence of making sure that my NMS wasn't able to talk to the internet? Exactly. It's security theater. It's just like, you know, taking our shoes off at the airport after someone has attempted that particular uh, exploit of the system. Um, we, you know, SolarWinds is going to be around. I, I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, and people just need to take, take the lessons from this and learn. You have to secure everything. You trust no one, not even what, you know, what you would think is a trusted system. Um, so it's, you know, defense in depth, zero security, you know, zero trust security, whatever buzzword you want to use, take it to heart and start implementing it. Yeah, and I don't know, I, I didn't, you know, follow the, the 100% the, the threat vector, you know, the, the way that they got into the SolarWinds, you know, product, uh, I didn't follow that in depth. But, you know, my question would be not so much why does the NMS talk to the internet, because there are there are valid reasons why your NMS would actually need to, you know, have access, you know, to, to you know, the internet in general. Uh, well, not in general. Uh, but, you uh, my question is, why don't people have that secured? In other words, why is that traffic path not locked down? Like SolarWinds needs to talk to this server or these servers or this update service, right? It's like my TV. I've got smart TVs in my house. Well, if you ever put a Wireshark trace on those and look, my TV, and I'm not going to say the brand, I have a personal ongoing problem with this brand, um, generates a ridiculous amount of traffic to thousands of different addresses 
constantly trying to update and check this and check that for all the smart software that goes on there and all the little different pieces and things like that. Um, you know, if SolarWinds is doing that, well, shame on them and shame on you for allowing it. If SolarWinds, however, is simply going back to the mothership for certain <laughs> types of updates, that I, I, I think that's a fairly benign activity. You just need to, you just need to be aware of it. You need to monitor it. You need to have it locked down. Yeah. And um, one of the problems you said, we need to know what SolarWinds should have been talking to, what its behavior should be. Well, we've been talking zero trust for about seven years now. Has anyone accomplished zero trust? No, it's because companies, I have not met with a single customer who understands their application dependencies. They don't know what needs to talk to what. Um, so that's a real problem. And you know, every day, if it's not SolarWinds, it's somebody else, um, there's a breach on the news. And so if I was the CISO, the first thing I would do is I would make sure I started moving into that zero trust model. Well, and, and the real question, Rita, not do the businesses know how their data is going around, but can the businesses ask their application um, developers, whether that be a SolarWinds or Microsoft, what does your product actually need to function? And can they get the answer? Because I, I found more and more when you ask that question, the developers that wrote the software have no clue what that total system really needs to talk. You know, does it really need to talk on 500 ports between all three servers or is it one port between two and then another one has to talk on somewhere else? And that that is the hardest part about doing zero trust is finding out what is actually legitimate, especially when you have something that maybe only talks once a quarter on that one port, but that's critical to the business. Well, and how many, how many of us, we, we probably all of us have been around long enough to remember, you know, all these products that used to have as part of their instructions for deployment, open this port range. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you know, and it was thousands of ports. And that was the instructions, literally open all of these ports. You know, well, how many of those products still exist? How many products out there, you know, still require you to have, you know, wide open blast radius for, you know, their traffic patterns. And a lot of times when you dig in and ask, they don't, you know, nobody can tell you why that is. Nobody can tell you what's actually happening on any given port. We just need this port range open, you know, so that's, that's a, that's a very large attack surface and uh and i would be highly suspicious of any product <laughs> in today's world that uh, still does that but so many companies have their legacy systems still in place um that yeah it really is going to be i mean there's so many so many different uh vendors out there that sell you know ways to do your application dependency mapping it's just to have a grasp on it um and it's very unfortunate. A lot of companies don't want to make that investment. Well, and I, you know, to your point, Rita, I used to work for a defense contractor and, uh, you know, one of the rules that we had, you know, that was part of just, you know, part of the way things had to happen was the products that we had developed, built and sold to the military had to, we had to have the original systems still up and operational for the lifetime of that product. So if we had a 30 year old product that was still in service, this was in the nuclear industry. So it's, it's not uncommon. We had to keep around all of these old, like HP UX servers um, and, and different things long past the lifetime of those products uh, because that was the rule. And that's not uncommon. So how do you secure those products? I mean, the first thing we did, obviously, was we took them off of, of being able to communicate outside of our network. But if somebody gets inside our network, or, you know, we have somebody who's authorized to be on our network who's inside, so an insider threat, how do you secure those products, right? And that's that's a problem because, you know, yeah, it's, it's easy to say we should all be using modern products that follow modern security paradigms, zero trust, we should have, you know, this, that, and the other. But if we're relegated to using some of these older products still, you know, that that's that's tough. So I guess the biggest question then is knowing that we have to deal with application developers who don't do a good job of documenting the code or worse yet, pulling in pieces that they have no idea how it works. It just added a function that we needed knowing that we have environments that are completely full of dependencies that we can't remove and dependencies that are old and unable to be secured, 
because that particular product, the developer that wrote it retired or that company went out of business, but we can't find something to replicate it. How do we push back and force companies to do better about security, to be more proactive about releasing security updates? How do we essentially vote with our dollar? Do we refuse to implement new things? Do we refuse to pay upkeep and maintenance? Uh, is there a, a, a good answer or are we just kind of stuck with the suck and we have to deal with what we have and maybe next time we'll do a better job of planning it all out. But in reality, we know that we're just going to buy whatever the updated version is because they're going to give us 40% off anyway. Yeah, we definitely need to get get all companies, um, you know, and it's to improve their security. And when there's something like solar winds, when something's big in the news, to me, that's a time to be talking um, to companies, you know, when it's top of mind, you know, I, re I remember the pushback on uh, disaster recovery. And then a year we had tons of floods. And so now everybody wanted to talk disaster recovery. Um, so the visibility, I mean, it's a shame it happened, but the visibility, uh, I think it's got a lot of people thinking. Yeah, unfortunately, I think the, I think you're right. The, the only way to get people talking and thinking secure is for them to be bit. Um, we have, you know, customers that have had massive ransomware attacks and we've had, you know, other types of threats and suddenly their security budgets open wide open and they get security people, they get all sorts of things. But up until that point, it was a, no, not gonna happen, too expensive, too expensive. Um, I, we had one business owner who came to us after a major event and basically said, this threatened my business more than any fire, flood, or tornado could have ever done. And I prepare for all those things. I have contingency plans for what if my building disappears. I didn't have a contingency plan for what if my business, my data was gone and I couldn't get to it. And so, you know, I, th I think that type of testimonial among the business community will help. Yeah, and when you look at the average co cost of a threat or a breach, it's $3.8 million if it's a Fortune 1000 company. If you look at that, plus the time to clean it up, the uh, how it affects the stock market, it's a whole lot more than the 3.8 million. And so when someone's hesitant to spend maybe 200, 400,000 on a solution, they think it's too expensive. Um, yeah, when they look at the big picture, what this actually cost, and no one's immune to it. Well, and the other thing too is in a, what I've noticed anyway in the security world, um, you know, just talking to a lot of different companies is you've got uh, companies buy into this and, and it's, it's their fault and vendors promote it. And I blame them a little bit more. And that is, here's this product. This product is going to solve your security issues. Buy this product and deploy it. And what they don't do is they don't look at what you were talking about, Rita, which is a zero trust you know, or whatever methodology we want to talk about, right? Um, they don't buy into a holistic approach to security. They buy into a like, how much does it cost? Here's this thing I can buy. I check the box, we're secure. And that's, you know, where some of these problems come from. I guarantee you a lot of these companies had their, well, we've got network monitoring, that box is checked. You know, we've got a firewall, that box is checked, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, and they don't actually look at, they don't actually look holistically at what needs to be done to truly secure the network. Yeah, just like, you know, the I, IPS, IDS appliances, um, most people will just put them in detection mode um, because, you know, as soon as they turn, turn on prevention mode, then traffic that they don't understand quits talking um, because it gets stopped. So what do they do? They just throw it wide open just leave it in detection mode and then never pay attention to it. Yeah, it's the classic IP allow any, any at the end of a firewall rules statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, and I think Rita, that, that sort of mindset of not turning on IPS or something, it's, it goes back to something that in my customer base, we're dealing with a lot of uh, school districts and other government entities that don't have a lot of budget. Their IT guys are underfunded they're they're not as well trained 
and they're trying to deal with these very complex things that companies that are, you know, Fortune 500 companies that ha are fully funded are struggling with, and then they're trying to deal with the same same problems. And uh, things like Solar Winds came up, and they they're just like, oh, how do I even know if I was hacked? I don't, you know, I can't afford to, you know, I can't afford to hire, you know, somebody to come in and do the forensics. I can't, so I have to just assume I wasn't, or wh where do I sit? And I think maybe that's the point where where we've reached that a lot of it's going to come down to resource availability. Yes, if I had an infinite amount of money and an infinite amount of hours in the day to completely rip everything out and replace it with something that's perfectly architected by people with an infinite amount of resources, then we wouldn't be having this conversation. Everything would be 100% secure and all of our employees would follow every regulation and guideline to the letter and no one would ever hack us. But the reality is, is that resource contention is why we are where we are. We never have enough money. We never have enough time. And lack of time and lack of money leads to mistakes that are exploited by people with more time than they need to pull that in to get more money. And that's why we end up where we are. And then we have to make the hard choices. Do we sacrifice time and money shutting something down and rebuilding it from scratch? Or do we save a little bit of those resources and instead sacrifice the potential lost revenue from customers or potential lost revenue from our reputation hit that we take by not shutting something down when we should have. There are no clear cut answers. And if you don't have a policy in place to deal with these kinds of things when they come up, the answers get a much, much more murky. And you're going to have to do some soul searching when that happens, um, because you'd rather do the soul searching with your team now then deal with the fallout of having to answer a bunch of hard questions from news media and security analysts. That should just about do it for this episode of the On-Premise IT Roundtable. I want to thank our guests for joining us today. If you are interested in more great premises like these, you can always check out our website at gestaltit.com slash podcast, where you can find the latest episode. You can also subscribe in your favorite podcast application of choice. Just follow along in Apple Podcasts or any one of a number of applications, including iTunes. And if you do make sure you leave us a review and a rating. Tell people why they should be listening to the on-premise IT roundtable because that's how we grow the listener audience. And it's how we great, get great premises like the one that Ben's story came up with for this episode. So for myself, Tom Hollingsworth, and for our great guests and for everyone who's a part of the Gestalt IT community, I wanna thank you very much for tuning in and please make sure to stay tuned for another great premise headed your way soon.